Okay. Oh. Okay. All right, pull up my slides. Okay, I'm just going to take you all through the battle, and then afterwards I'll open it up and you guys can fire at me. You can ask me anything you want to ask about leadership, the Army, whatever you want to ask me about. Uh, next slide, please. Next. Okay, so uh, in terms of our, our division mission, we're just fortunate enough to be in Kuwait six months prior to the attack going off in, in Baghdad. And so my brigade was part of the old intrinsic action where we used to rotate a brigade into uh, Kuwait. Uh, we still do that today. We call it Operation uh, uh, Spartan Shield. But, but back then, the Army used to rotate a brigade into Kuwait every six months. And so my brigade was over there on that rotation, uh, commanded by uh, General Dave Perkins. I think you all have dinner with him tonight. He was a colonel at the time. He was my brigade commander. And we had spent six months over there. And we heard the rumblings of war and so forth, and we got after training. Every single day, we trained for whatever wherever the case may be, if we were supposed to cross the berm, we were getting after it every single day. At the end of the six months, I will tell you, it was probably the best trained brigade in the Army. We got all kind of ammunition, we got the best equipment, we got everything. Uh, and so uh, we were fortunate enough to be stationed in Kuwait at the time to be able to train for this particular mission. Uh, about our, our six months stay there, the rest of the division, 3rd Infantry Division, started flowing over. The two infantry brigades that were left at home station, we brought over an aviation brigade, we brought over the, over the field artillery brigade, and we brought over the cab squadron and the aviation brigade as well, the entire division. This is our division mission statement of note, defeat the 11th Infantry Division. There is a series of uh, bridges located along the Euphrates River. And the only way to get to Baghdad, we had to seize those bridges in order to cross over the Euphrates River to get to Baghdad. So you see that up there. And on order, destroy the Medina Division. If you all do not know about the Medina Division, that was part of Sa Saddam Hussein's Republican Guard Force, it's supposed to be one of the elite divisions uh, in his force structure, okay? Next slide. This right here is the border between Iraq and Kuwait. So this is Kuwait here. Uh, this is Iraq on this side. What these three uh, lines here represent, those are crossing sites. Uh, the, the border had a berm, a huge berm. You can see it right here. And we had to dig these crossing sites with engineers in order to even get through the berm to commence our attack. And so the division arrayed itself with two brigades in the north, the third brigade and the first brigade arrayed in the north. They would be the initial main attack. And then this is my brigade down here, the second brigade down at this location. Cav Squadron was also down at this location as well. And we had both the aviation as well as the uh, division artillery split between two. And you can see the boundaries right here. So all these red marks here meant that we had to cut through that berm with engineers before we commenced the attack. But before cutting through that berm, where you see these splash marks here, the Iraqis had border posts out there that had people in those border posts monitoring that berm and those that were across that berm. So we had to defeat that threat first. And the way we did that is through, uh, we did an artillery raid on those uh, uh, border posts, followed by age 64s, followed by down in the south, my battalion led the cut through this, these berms here, all three of them, and then we finished the destruction of these uh, border post here. We came out here and we established a screen line to allow the Division Cav Squadron to come through and pass through, and then pass through our, our uh, second brigade, my higher headquarters. And so while many thought that the, the attack 
commenced on the 21st of March. The main attack commenced on the 21st of March. On the 20th, I was sitting on this side of the berm, all alone and all afraid, uh, with approximately 1,300 soldiers in Iraq, and no one knew it uh, from the Iraqis. Same in the north, they had also a battalion up there as well. So the main attack happened in the, in the north, supporting the attack initially with my brigade coming, coming through the south. Next slide. All right, so this is a depiction of the entire fight. And I, I wanted to show you this because, as you can see here, this is Kuwait. And you can see the distance, 300 miles in which we had to travel and fight. And so the way we conducted uh, operations here, we had uh, the 1st Brigade and the 3rd Brigade, they attacked along this main axis here. And their mission was to protect the northern flank of my brigade, to allow us to continue to push hard and quickly to get up here in order to continue to fight and to seize the crossing sites. I'll talk about that. And so the objectives that you see here, Firebird here and Objective Chatham, that was, that was the, uh, the first brigade and the third brigade objectives in order to seize those. They had pretty good fights up there while we continued to move uh, around their flanks and get up here. You'll see a series of objectives here. We fought these objectives through the time period. I won't discuss all the time periods here. Objective Floyd, Objective Rams. We fought those objectives there. If you ever heard of Al Samoa, Al Nasiriyah, and the Jeff, we did a quick fight there and turned out over to the Hunt first. I think, uh, Chris, you were part of that fight up there with, with Ben Hodges and Anna Jeff. Continue the fight through here, and we reached up north here as what was called the Kabbalah Gap. Kabbalah is a city uh, inside Kuwait. It was a bowl between Kuwait and, uh, and Baghdad. And as we fought this here, we expected to get a chemical attack. Uh, that attack never came. So we went ahead and launched the attack early from Kabbalah Gap to seize what you see right there is that uh, fire marker right there. That is the main bridge from Kabbalah going to Baghdad. And so that bridge right there was seized initially by 369 Armor, uh, got up there first. Then I came behind, took over the bridge site, established a defense located there with 315 Infantry, my battalion, and we fought there for the better part of three days to hold that bridge there because the Iraqis wanted it back. And so a uh, major fight there. That's where we really got into really hooking and jabbing for three days uh, with the Medina Division. The rest of my brigade moved forward to Objective Saints, where they met the, the, uh, most of the Medina Division and Objective Saints. After the third day of fighting this fight with my uh, battalion, I was given the order by my DCG, who's now General Retired Lord Austin, to attack south to destroy the remaining remnants of another Republican Guard division that was down in this area here. You can't see it here, but it was called Objective Peach. Uh, and there was another Republican Guard division down there, uh, which we had a significant fight down there. That lasted until April 6th. These dates, I'm throwing them out because they're critical. So April 6th, my battalion was down south in Escondaria. The 2nd Brigade, uh, my higher headquarters brigade, located on Objective Saints. On the 6th, General Perkins, then Colonel Perkins, uh, went back to the division commander, sitting on Objective Saints right there, and wanted to push further into Baghdad, so he requested to do an armed reconnaissance of Baghdad through the city. 1st Brigade, you heard me talk about 1st Brigade here, they moved up around us, 2nd Brigade, and took the airport. Reason in taking the airport, strategic in nature for, for Iraq, their only major airport, vicinity of Baghdad, the seat of power. So 1st Brigade took the airport, seized that airport there. By the way, 
Uh, those of you who don't know this, this is where we got the Medal Honor recipient, a guy by the name of uh, Sergeant Smith, engineer, uh, Medal Honor winner, posthumously uh, died on uh, Baghdad Airport. Pretty much uh, took down a significant force itself uh, and fought to his death uh, at that location. Um, so I'm down here the night of the 6th. I'm sitting there probably around 20 hundred hours fighting that fight down there and I get a call from General Perkins. Steph, I need you to quickly come up to Objective Sinks and I'm a pretty good distance and it's at night. Uh, I got a mission for you. And I said, hmm, what could this be? The whole time he had missions for us, by the way. And, and just so you all know, um, the entire time we left Baghdad, from the time we got up to, to uh, excuse me, Kuwait, to the time we got to Baghdad, every single order that we received was over the doggone radio, do this, do that. It was great. Go back to the training in Kuwait. There is no way we would have been able to do that, but we fell back on our training. So the whole time in Kuwait, General Perkins, he was training us to be flexible and adaptable. Don't worry about orders. Just do what I say and move out smartly. And of course, we had input. But the bottom line is we could move on a dime and not have to worry about a bunch of paper and all that great stuff because we had trained so much and so well down in Kuwait to be able to do it. And we were able to move rapidly, uh, and we surprised a lot of people on how rapidly uh, we were moving simply because we were highly agile as a re result of our training. And so uh, uh, he instructed me to move my battalion into objective saints. At that point in time, we called it attack position because uh, most of the enemy had been defeated. I got my, uh, my battalion into this location about 2 o'clock, 2 a.m. in the morning. Um, I launched my three, S3, to link up uh, with him because I was getting the rest of the doggone battalion into the Saints. So I launched my three to link up with him. And when he came back, he said, my three, sir, we're attacking in the Baghdad. I was floored. Okay, uh, the reason why I was floored, number one, uh, in terms of intelligence, very rarely did we receive any intelligence on the enemy. We had to go find the enemy, okay? We were moving so fast that intelligence, army intelligence could not keep up with us. So we had to go find the enemy. And so we'd just do a movement to contact and pick a fight all the way through. Uh, and most of the time, wherever we went, we found the enemy. But the other piece of this is, you know, you sort of look around, and you see that you have one brigade. It's 3 o'clock in the morning, and we're getting ready to launch attack. Who's coming with us? You know what I mean? In this big city. And if you don't know about Baghdad back then, Baghdad had 5 million people in Baghdad. It was a major city. And this one brigade, and this one brigade only, our intent was to attack into Baghdad, seize um, key infrastructure, and cause the collapse of uh, the Saddam Hussein regime. That was the intent. Okay. So you can also imagine looking at my company commanders telling them this. Every last one of them, are we crazy or what? No, we're not crazy. We're doing this. Okay? And this was the first time from the time I left Kuwait to the time we moved up here. Remember this. You got to be able to sense your soldiers, the reaction of your soldiers. And you need to know when to get them all together and provide that common effect. 
And so uh, I told my company commanders, go back and tell their, their soldiers. And I knew then how this thing was going to be. I could just play it out. And so uh, I decided to get the company commanders and my staff guys. We found this old burned out building that's just south of Objective Saints. Uh, I brought them in there. I kept most of the uh, security out because we were, we were getting probing fire by remnants of the Medina Division. And I pretty much uh, had my three, based on the guidance that I gave them, issue an operations order. And then after that operations order, we did a rehearsal right there, uh, right there in that burnout building. We just got a bunch of flashlights, and I just started drilling my company commanders on the plan. Okay? Then after that, I knew I had to talk to them, and I did this speech about leadership. I talked to them about dying and all that great stuff, uh, and then we got after it told them to go back and talk to their soldiers, do a rehearsal, told them about security, all that great stuff. A couple hours after that, we're LD. So as, uh, I think it was about uh, 05, I can't remember. Uh, I was listening to the brigade net, and the battalion commander that did their thunder run on the 6th of April did the Armed reconnaissance, a guy by the name of uh, Eric Swartz. And again, keep in mind, we knew nothing about Baghdad, but I knew he had been in there. He did the loop around back to the airport. So I asked him to come up on the net and give me as much as intelligence. And so he gave me a pretty good dump. But as I was listening to the brigade radio, I knew something wasn't right uh, because uh, we pushed the scouts up there and they discovered a minefield on Highway 8, the main highway going into to Baghdad. Huge minefield uh, up there. And then they started receiving fire from up there. And so as I started plotting different things on my map, the situation had changed pretty rapidly by the time I'd briefed the operations order on what we wanted to do up until the time that we LD. Okay? And I knew based on, I'll show you my task organization here in a few minutes, but I could tell you based on my task organization that I didn't have enough soldiers to do the mission I was asked based on what I got from, from uh, Colonel Swartz and based on what I was picking up over the radio. Next slide. Okay, so real quickly, so the plan for our 2nd Brigade we had three maneuver battalions, 164 armor, 464 armor, and of course my, my battalion, 315 infantry. So 164 armor, they were gonna take the, uh, this objective here. 464 armor would take this objective here. You can see what those consist of. That is the heart and the seat of the power right there. So that's where they're going. They were gonna put tanks into the, in Saddam Hussein's palace, and so forth. So we're going after the heart of the seat of power. Okay? My job was it was to seize these three key intersections right here. Okay? So I had these objectives here. Uh, you can see all the stuff that was on there. We call uh, my uh, ops, non commissioned officer and captain, they came up with the call these objectives, Mo, uh, Larry, and Curly. So that's what we called them. And you can see the the objectives here, three key intersections, and we're supposed to hold those intersections. So seize the intersections, and then establish a hasty defense to hold those intersections to allow all the logistics and follow-on forces from the division to flow behind us. So that was the deal there. So if we lost those intersections right there, imagine what would have happened to these forces. Okay? It would have been rear doored by the enemy, and if we lost those intersections there, we couldn't get the rest of the division. So these intersections here were critical to the fight. Next slide. All right, basically what I told you, Molaire and Curley, along Highway 8, the intersections there, 
and you can see to keep the lines of communication open for follow-on forces to come through and so forth. Next slide. All right. So we're in a pretty interesting situation uh, down at uh, Ejecta Saints where we uh, had our attack position. And so General, General Perkins, uh, then Colonel Perkins, he needed a reserve force. We needed something in case we got in trouble. And so he called me up on the net and said, hey, Steph, I need two platoons for me because I absolutely need a reserve. Okay? And I said, Roger, sir, I've done my assessment. I probably need those two platoons, but I also know you need them, so it is what it is. And so uh, I cut those two platoons, um, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. You see right here, BCT control, those, are the, those two platoons that went to General Perkins, they stayed and ejected Saints, and they did not tack up through Highway 8. They were reserved in the event that General Perkins needed. Okay? So about the time that we LD'd and we started moving up uh, um, through Baghdad, I'm sure he'll, is he going to brief tonight at all? Is he going to talk about his? Great. He'll talk to you about the, the missile that came in on his command center. Okay? So there were, at that point in time, we had a lot of fog, friction, a war going on. The major command center that's going to make all this happen receives a, uh, I'm pointing to this, but the, the brigade's command center, received a missile and blew the entire command center up, killed several soldiers, wounded a lot of soldiers, burned a lot of soldiers up, uh, pretty much destroyed that, that command system. Well, anyway, uh, going to objective Mo. I'll show you their objective in a few minutes. Led by uh, Captain Josh Wright. This is what he had at his disposal going into objective Mo. It was the furthest objective inside Baghdad. So he was going to take the first objective. Okay? Told you about uh, under the BCT control, the, the company commander at that time, Ronnie Johnson. He was also down under BCT control. So General Perkins had the company commander, and two uh, platoons down there. On objective Larry, I had Bravo 164 uh, armor. I had a tank company attached to me. You can see what uh, two tank platoons, a infantry platoon, and engineer. I'll talk about these engineers here in a few minutes because they, they, these engineers, I wouldn't be standing here uh, if it wasn't for these engineers. And I'll talk to you about that in a few minutes. Uh, an ejected Curly. I didn't have a company commander. So I took an operations captain out of my S3 shop. Guy by the name of Zan Hornbuckle. Okay? Hey, you, you are now a company commander. I did that at 1 o'clock in the morning. He had no clue. It shocked him. It overwhelmed him. But when I assessed the situation, I could not give this mission to the platoon leader. I, need some, I needed some experience uh, on this objective. And so I took that captain, threw him in a vehicle, and he now became company commander. That could happen to you, by the way. Okay? All right. Uh, and call this outfit here Team Zan. So you can see what he had. Uh, he had uh, an infantry platoon. He had the, the engineer platoon down here. He had the mortars, which became critical to his fight. So I placed the mortars with him because where we were going, I had 4.2 uh, mortars at my disposal so they could reach all the way to my limit. So I left the mortars with him to, to be able to provide protection. And then, of course, under task force control, I had the the headquarters of that engineer outfit there. I had the scout platoon. I had my, my uh, aviation element with me. I went and I located on this with uh, objective Larry, and I'll show you the objectives here in a second. Next slide. Okay, so here you'll, you'll see objective Mo. That's the intersection, the Spaghetti Johnson Junction that leads into the city as well as leads to the Baghdad airport. So that was Objective Mo. Objective Larry in the center here. 
I position myself in the center to be able to move this way if needed or this way if needed. Uh, and that was a, a key intersection. Uh, had a lot of spaghetti routes that you could go in uh, spaghetti-wise into the, to the airport or you can go downtown. Uh, ejected Curly, where I felt we would get the least resistance, uh, ended up being the most resistance. It was down south. This was what we called our back door. They pretty much shut the door for us and protected the, the rear to allow us to, to seize the two as well as seize that one. Okay? And again, you can see 464 armors ejective here as well as 164 is on ejective. Okay? What I will tell you is, when we conducted the, the attack, led, led by first 164 armor, because they had been there first, the six, so they sort of knew their way through the city, so they led the attack, followed by 464 armor, uh, tightly behind them, and then followed by me to be able to seize these, these uh, objectives. So soon as, uh, no later than probably, uh, and excuse me if I can't get the time right, because I will tell you, everything was in a blur when the fight went down. So as soon as I get, got uh, Team Alpha into his position, he immediately came under significant uh, fighting on that particular objective. All three of these battles, relentless fighting on all three of these uh, objectives. Fedeyang, suicide uh, bombers, you name it, they threw it at us. They knew in order to protect their city that they needed those three objectives back. And so they threw everything they could to try and take those objectives back, okay? We fought uh, at hour six of constant fighting. And at this point in time, I was smoked uh, because I was running up back and forth, talking to company commanders on the net, you know, dodging bullets and so forth and all that great stuff that, that we do when, when we fight. Uh, Alpha company commander came up on the net and say, hey, uh, I don't know if I can hold it too much longer. Oh, by the way, I'm about out of ammunition. Okay? No more than 30 minutes after he called, uh, he's about out of ammunition, this guy calls. Hey, boss, uh, I'm about to get overrun. I can't hold any longer. Remember, he only has a platoon of infantrymen and engineers down there in the mortars. So he calls me up and says, I probably got about 30 more minutes of fighting, and that's it for me. Okay, I have no more. So the mortar platoon uh, that was located down there, I called down to the mortar platoon leader. I asked him how many rounds he had left. He had a significant amount of mortars left. And so at that point in time, that was my main effort. It saved the day. When he finished firing all his rounds, none of those doggone mortar uh, tubes could be used anymore. They were all red and all melted, okay? Danger close, uh, mortars throughout the fight, okay? All those burning vehicles that you saw on the film, you guys remember seeing them burning vehicles? Okay, if you notice, they weren't the enemy's burning vehicles. They were my burning vehicles, okay? Uh, and all the sweating and the, and the, uh, the uh, soldiers, we uh, lost somewhere in the neighborhood of 65 to 70 casualties on these three objectives here, okay? All right, so at hour seven, the leader, Steph Twitty, had to make a decision, okay? One of these days, you're going to have to make the same decision that I had to make. Okay. And this is what you need to get out of this presentation. Okay. You go back to what I said about winning. Our job is to win. Okay. I fully understood my boss's intent, Colonel Perkins. We we're going to stay tonight, is what he said and we're going to take Baghdad, okay? And I was the key to all that, I being 315 infantry. And if we didn't complete our mission, he couldn't complete his mission, 
the division could not complete their mission, and our nation could not complete the mission that we had a toppling Saddam Hussein. So you got to understand how all that fits in. You also got to understand is there are going to be times when you're going to have to make hard decisions. And you know that it's going to probably take the lives of your soldiers in doing so. You know. Absolutely no. I knew when I made this decision that it was going to be bad uh, on the outfit. But I also knew what my mission was. And so we had uh, positioned logistics assets down here. And it was either soldiers, uh, lots of soldiers die up here as a result of running out of ammunition and supplies, or try our best to run this gauntlet. And it was a gauntlet full of nothing but RPG, fire, you name it, it was coming. And so uh, I called up my company commanders. I got them all on the net. So you have to provide also the calm when there's a storm. It's you. You're the leader. You provide the calm to the storm. Because at this time, there were a lot of panicking going on. Okay? Because soldiers felt the worst would happen. And I felt the worst would happen. But they didn't know it. Okay? Even when you know things are going to go bad, you have to provide the calm. That's the first thing. The second thing, never lie to your soldiers. Okay? The minute you lie to your soldiers, you have lost credibility. Not with just the soldier that you lied to. Trust me, with that entire outfit. Never lie to your soldiers. So I brought them up on the net, every single company commander. You know, it's all about listening. Back then, it was all FM. And I could hear in their voices the panic or the whatever you want to call it. And I told them at that point in time, look, I will do my best to get supplies to you. But you also have to understand the situation we're in. And all of us may die on these three objectives tonight. That may just happen. But I need you to fight to your death if we die. There's a difference in just dying. But fighting to your death to die, I mean, you're going to take something with you. You guys tracking me? And so uh, then I got my uh, S4 up on the net. And I gave him instructions. And I got a volunteer. My scout platoon sergeant was listening on the net. Uh, and he said, sir, I'll volunteer to lead the, the convoy. OK, this uh, scout platoon sergeant, he had been in the Army for a while, had 11 kids. Most of those kids were young, too. OK? So he quickly linked up with uh, my G4, got the logistics in place, led the logistics forward, and he was killed about right there where that blue, okay? The scout platoon sergeant, blown out of his vehicle by an RPG, leading the logistics, okay? Next guy came up on the net. It was total chaos at that point in time. Say, sir, I got it. We can make this thing happen. That guy was killed right there, just south of there. OK? Two heroes. You hear me talk about soldiers will go to hell and back for you if they know you care that they have confidence in you as a leader. They'll go to hell and back for you. And also, they'll risk their own lives. And that's what happened that day. They risked their own lives. Okay? 
We got, uh, we got a portion of the uh, logistics package up. We sent a total of uh, uh, four vehicles up. Out of those four vehicles, three of them were destroyed. Three ammunition trucks and another truck. Three of the trucks, so four ammunition trucks, three of those trucks were destroyed. Now what? Not enough ammo. Okay? So we launched two more ammunition trucks, uh, excuse me, three more up. Uh, one of those trucks were destroyed prior to getting up to this location right here. Okay? Uh, so I made the decision because of a lack of ammunition. I was concerned about uh, Alpha here. There are two mosques up there in the north there, and he was getting pounded with RPG fire, but he didn't have much to shoot back with him. So I made the decision to take those trucks with ammunition and just run the gauntlet and hope, hope, and hope is not a method, but at that point in time, that's all I had, and hope that they get up to, to his location. Two of those trucks got up to his location, and we were able to resupply that northern route there. Uh, we resupplied, uh, sent uh, a halted another truck right in here, I can't remember where, pushed it back down to eject Curly, got them ammunition. Bravo 6-4 tank, I held them up. That's where I was located. I held them up from getting resupplied. He had a little bit more uh, ammunition than most, so I would not give him resupply. Uh, and so four more hours after resupply, uh, we continued to fight. But the, the, the thing that turned the tide was getting the ammunition up there to allow us. The motivation went sky high, uh, you can imagine. Once you got ammunition, it went sky high, okay? Somewhere around 2100 at night, uh, we got this thing under control. At about 2110, I collapsed in my Bradley fighting vehicle from, from exhaustion. Three hours prior to that, I was moving with the infantry platoon that was on this objective here. Uh, to try and get an advantage point. Uh, we were getting serious fire on the flank over here. And so I tried to move in there to, behind him to figure out how we could get fires in there and so forth. And a suicide bomber came down the, the side street and came straight at me. Remember me talking about that engineer? Another hero engineer was in an ace vehicle. You all know what an ace vehicle is? Any? Well, he was in an ace vehicle, saw, him, saw that vehicle coming uh, behind me. He pulls this doggone ace out and T-bones him, and the thing blows up. Suicide vehicle. Blows up. Saved my life right there on Objective Larry. Okay? Remember, that's what soldiers would do for you if you love them. Got it? Okay, so, uh, um, you know, I collapsed in my, like most of us did, we just collapsed, I was drenched, totally drenched. And it felt like I lost 20 pounds. My clothes were hanging off of me that day because all the adrenaline and excitement and everything else, um, and so, uh, as night fell, uh, we took control of these objectives. I called back to General Perkins and said, okay, we got this thing. At that point in time, he called up the division and said that uh, we can continue to take Baghdad, and which we did. We woke up the next morning. That's where you saw the statue. I don't even know how old you all were. You may not even been born. Are you 15? <laughs> well, anyway. Probably saw the statue coming down. Do you guys see the statue coming down? Okay, so that was my vehicle that pulled that statue down. Um, and so, and uh, the rest is history. Next slide. Okay, I've talked about some of these things. I, I uh, put a couple of things down that I want you to know about. All right, know your soldiers. 
You've heard me say that over and over and over again. But the other thing that you did not hear me, know their strengths and know their weaknesses. So as you're sizing up your folks, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if you knew in your platoons, for instance, who the hunters were, the deer hunters? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? What do you think? When I was a platoon leader, that was a requirement as well. I wanted to know who the hunters were, okay? Because they probably can shoot, and therefore, I'm probably going to put them in the front because they can get after it. Not the person that's from New York City, not to say that those from New York City can't can't hit anything, but you guys get what I'm talking about, right? So it's stuff like that that you got to think through, okay? So know their strengths and weaknesses, okay? And by the way, make sure you listen to me on this. Your soldiers will act vastly different in combat than they will in garrison. Now let me give you a thought. I'm not big on firing people, never have been. I can tell you I probably only fired five people in my 32 years of service, meaning relieved. And the reason why I'm not big on it, it goes back to knowing your people and where they came from, obviously. But you also have to believe, like me, that every single person in your organization has a talent. But guess what? You have to find it. It's up to you to find it. So don't be too quick to fire folks. Because I guarantee you, if you work hard at it, you will find the talent. You guys tracking me? Y'all sleep or what? All right, so, so remember that. Okay? But this garrison versus uh, uh, in combat thing I want to talk to you about. I had some mediocre soldiers in garrison. Took them to combat, and they were superstars. Absolute superstars. Okay? And so you got to understand that some soldiers, it's just a matter of where they're going to thrive. Some will go and they'll thrive in combat, but they will just be mediocre or average soldiers in garrison. You got to figure all that out, okay? Again, don't be too quick to fire because I had uh, some mediocre soldiers that I knew about being a battalion commander, man, and I took them to combat. And, man, they were dancing on the dance floor, okay? You got it? Okay. You see this here? Remember me talking about that storm? On the 7th of April, I had a serious storm, three of them, all at one time. The most challenging thing I've ever done in my 32 years of service was right here. That day on 7 April. Absolutely the most challenging. Every single day I think about that fight, okay? It has molded me into the leader that I am today. But the one thing I will tell you is, you have to be the calm. Because if they see you spazzing out, if they see you scared, They're going to really think things are bad. And remember, I told you, don't lie to them, but don't make it harder than what it is. You got to be the calm. You got to get them through it. You got to tell them that it's going to be all right. You got to be honest with them. Yeah, we may lose some people. You all hear me on this? Ah, y'all sleep. You didn't do PT this morning. All right. You see that again, right? 
Now you understand. You look at this here, this fight, now you understand why it's important that it's your job to motivate, inspire, and lead. Now the reason why it's your job to do all that, because when it's time to take the hill, wherever the hill is, you can't do it unless you have those three right there. Can't happen. Soldiers got to be motivated, okay? Because it's going to be bad. So they got to be motivated. They got to have a cause to fight. You're going to provide that cause for them. They got to be inspired. They got to understand that this is all about winning for our nation. And you're going to inspire them to, so they know that they can do this. And then you got to lead. Okay? You got to lead them. You got to lead them to victory. You hear me? Okay. Your self awareness, deal with reality. It is what it is. Remember me talking about when all three asking for ammunition? It is what it is. Deal with reality. Okay? It is your problem to deal with, not theirs. You can't wish stuff like that away, okay? Because if you wish it away, we lose. Had I wished it away, making that decision to bring ammunition for it, we lose, okay? So deal with reality. Next. Nope, go back. I'll tell you when to change slide. You see this one here? Okay, so if you read the, the uh, transcript or whatever it was they gave you all, you'll see in there on ejected curly that I asked Zan Hornbuckle to put my command sergeant major on the net. How many of you read that? In the, yeah. Why do you think I did that? Get a straight answer. All right, so I want you to imagine. You think about this. I pull a captain out of the three stop. You're commanding the day. Go for it and do great things. And that captain wanted to go for it and do great things. And he did not want to look bad in front of me. You guys understand what I'm saying? He wanted to please me and accomplish the mission. This is his time. He's going to be a commander in combat. And when stuff was going to, you know what I'm talking about. Trust but verify. Command Sergeant Major, on the net, my most trusted advisor, tell me what the heck is really going on down there. Because at this time, I'm trying to get Mo under control. I need you to assist me down there, Command Sergeant Major. Tell me what's going on. Trust but verify. Okay? Next. You heard that before, right? There's going to be a lot of bad news when you go to combat. There's going to be bad news anytime. Never lose your integrity with your soldiers. They look for you to be credible. You are the standard uh, bearer for our army values, and they know it. You hold people accountable, but do you hold yourself accountable? Is the question. Not if you lie to your soldiers. All right, this gets back to this one here. Emotions, 
you had the great doctor up here talking about it. I'll give you my spin on it. It goes in line with what I talked to you about the calm with the storm and all. You send a message. First of all, when you show up to your unit, your platoon, and you go out to training, and you start spazzing out, uh-oh, lieutenant, she doesn't know her craft. Uh-oh, she doesn't know doctrine. Big signals start permeating throughout that platoon. This lieutenant doesn't know jack. Okay? Watch your emotions. It's not about you. Okay? Uh, that one there? Only you. That's why we pay you. There's some things that only you can fix. Even as a three-star today, I'm constantly fixing things because there's some things that only you can fix. Believe it or not, after three-star, it's four-star. By the way, that five-star that he was showing you, there's no longer a five-star. We got something called Goldwater Nichols now, okay? All right? And so for me, on occasion, I even have to go to my four-star boss because there's some things that only he can fix. But you need to know the things that only you can fix in your organization. And I guarantee you, if you sat down and you thought about it, even as a second lieutenant, we ask a lot of you, and there's a lot of things that only you, only you will be able to fix. Okay? Own your mistakes. Own them. You're going to make a lot of mistakes, and it's okay, as long as you learn from them. Okay? You're going to make a lot of mistakes. You're going to make a lot of mistakes in garrison. You're going to make a lot of mistakes in, in combat. But you've got to own up to them. You've got to own them. You've got to tell your soldiers that you, you, not them, you made the mistakes. You got to tell your leaders that it was you. You got to be honest about your profession. That's why we are a professional army. It's okay to make mistakes. Okay? Next. Okay. I'm not going to go through all these because I want to, uh, I'll let you all read them. Someone spoke to me. Someone said something. Okay. I'm going to let you all read these instead of going through them. Okay? Uh, because I want to open it up for questions. Okay? All right. The floor is yours. What do you want to talk to me about? Yes, sir. Finally got that football team winning, huh? Ah. Yeah, so uh, General Hughes and I, we've been friends for a long time. General Hughes knew me as a second lieutenant. We served together in the 101st. And uh, I am an introvert. You would never know it, okay? It is hard for me uh, to even stand up here and talk to you all, okay? I always have to practice it. My wife will tell you that I can be home for a week, and if I say more than 10 words, she would be highly impressed, okay? Any of my closest friends will tell you the same thing, okay? So how many of you all in here are introverts? Raise your hand. Okay, wow. That many of us? Here's what I will tell you. 
When I was a second lieutenant platoon leader, I didn't understand how to work across the aisle. You know what the cross the aisle is? So what's the cross the aisle? If you're an introvert, then what's across the aisle? Come on now, you didn't do PT, so I can understand. So you have to understand, for those of you that, that are introverts out there, the majority, and, and, and General Hughes talked about this last week, the majority of your soldiers are going to be extroverts. Although I knew everything about them and would talk to them about that, uh, and talk to them about several things and so forth, um, relationship building is everything with your soldiers. Okay? And you, well, I think I could have improved socially, there you are, socially even with fellow officers in the battalion uh, is uh, working across the aisle, okay? I was very shy on top of that, and, and uh, Chris will tell you, out of the entire brigade, for you minority officers in here, here's something for you. Out of the entire brigade, there were only two black officers out of the entire brigade until we had a brigade commander came in after that. Remember when Lay came in? I was one, and we had a captain by the name of Captain Dingle, who was the second, in the entire brigade. Okay? Which is okay, because I saw that as an opportunity. All eyes were on me, you know? And so, uh, what I will tell you is, so if you're an introvert out there, work on that, because your, your best teammates will be ext extroverts, okay? Just work on that. Next. Cadet Moser from Seattle University, sir. Um, facing the- You don't even have a football team, do you? No, sir. See, I know about football, man. It was Go a ahead. Mistake. So facing the adverse situations with the uh, heavy casualties and lack of ammunitions, what are some methods you use to keep your emotions in check and be the calm during the storm? Yeah, uh, I, I will tell you, I'm just a calm dude by nature, man. Uh, first, first of all, I have a lot of trust in soldiers, a lot. We have the best doggone soldiers in our Army. You all have to believe that you're going to go lead the absolute best. Okay? That crap that someone said at the school a couple of weeks ago about our soldiers and they're dumb and all that great stuff, I suggest you not believe that. Okay? Our soldiers are smart and they'll see right through you. Okay? And so, um, in terms of keeping the emotions checked, uh, I'm a doctrine type of guy. I thrive on knowing my stuff. I have to know my stuff. And so that's the way to reduce emotions. If you know your stuff, then people can challenge you. You don't have to get upset about it. You're confident about it. You got swagger. And so I don't need to get upset about not knowing my stuff. That's one, uh, I will tell you. The other thing that I will tell you in terms of emotion, uh, at 32 years in service, I've seen it all, okay? But even without seeing it all, coming up in the Army, it's not that hard. The Army is not complex. It's pretty doggone easy. And there's nothing to get all flustered about. It's just everyday leading soldiers, everyday motivating soldiers, everyday inspiring soldiers, everyday holding soldiers accountable, those type things. The Army is a great place to be because you've got great soldiers and it's not that hard. And so I wouldn't worry about the emotions. You know, I, I heard this guy up here and I saw well and good. I'm giving you a different spin on it. You go and you know your stuff, you know your soldiers, the emotion thing, you'll be okay. Okay? 
So could I Kim from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign? Our football team's pretty bad, so Yeah, I was, getting ready, yeah. I was um, getting ready to tell you. What's there? I was getting ready to tell you. It's good. You thought just because you brought the little pro football coach in, you're going to make strides at it, didn't you? That's what we thought. But, and, That's what you, you know, thought. We paid a lot See, of money. I know for... all about I'll tell you all about your football because I'm a big college football fan. We're playing the, we're playing the long game, sir. We so. got a University of Alabama in here. Roll Tide. Congratulations to you. That was an awesome game. All right, I'm going to finish up with the roll tide. I'm going to give you a story to finish this thing up. Go ahead. Uh, so my question has to do with the, um, the battle that you were in. Yeah. So what enemy aspect were you not considering that made the battle go longer than you expected? Hey, look, it wasn't, an, it wasn't so much the enemy aspect. Um, I want you to think about it. I want you to think about this. Where do you live? Chicago. Oh, man. Holy smoke, you don't live on the south side, eh? I'm getting ready to duck. What about the west side? What about the west side? <laughs> well, anyway, I want you to think about this. If someone came into your house, are you going to fight to the death and throw the kitchen sink at them, or are you just going to let them take it? Okay, so that's what they did. I mean, I would like to think if someone invaded America that we're all going to fight to the death. Are we? I don't know about y'all because y'all didn't do PT this morning. <laughs> Are you tracking what I'm saying? And so it wasn't so much about it was the, the enemy knew that this was it. And they were holding the Medina division and all the Republican and the Fedahim. They were holding their best for the battle, and they threw their best at the battle. And I will tell you, and I, as I told many, and they did a pretty damn good job, okay? So, did I answer your question? Great, next. Sir Cadet Jessica Maddox, United States Military Academy, Beat Navy. All right, I was getting ready to say, talk <laughs> about your football. You're doing well, though. So my question for you, sir, was you mentioned your um, mortar platoon leader who was able to fight effectively at an objective further away from your battalion headquarters. What qualities and attributes did you look for in selecting your mortar and scout platoon leadership? The best, the best officers in the battalion. Scout platoon leader number one, mortar platoon leader number two, Support platoon leader number three, the best. She said, what qualities? I go back to it. Know your craft. Know your doctrine. Motivate, inspire, and lead. See, I'm a, I told you I'm from South Carolina. Anybody in here from South Carolina? All right, where do you guys go to school? They go, they go to Clemson, so they're going to be mad when I talk about this story about Alabama here, man. But anyway, um, Pretty simple. Demonstrate that you can do those things, you own the A list. Don't demonstrate them, then you won't be getting the platoon. Okay? Next question. Uh, Cadet Otis, Alcorn State University. But my question is how big did religion play in the emotional intelligence part? Yeah. Well, you will have to decide that. I, in terms of my religion, I'm a spiritual person. And so I think you have to find something to rally behind in terms of self. So every morning, in fact, my eight and I, we drove here seven hours. He will tell you what we talked about. What do you think we talked about? No. <laughs> we talked about the Bible. Okay? So every morning I get up, I get up at 4.30 in the morning. I read the Bible, and I go do PT. Okay? That's what sustains me. I, I know that they're a bigger calling. You hear me talk about uh, what happened on that objective? I'm here. Shortly after that, by the way, I came home. 2006, I was diagnosed with cancer. Okay? So uh, you, you got to go through things to understand that, hey, 
and I'm here today. I could have been put out of the Army in 2006. And oh, by the way, sometimes you got to make decisions. I had cancer, and I refused to be relieved, and I deployed with my brigade to Iraq. Why stay at home and be miserable and think about it? Will you go and be with the troops and the soldiers that you love that's going to get you through this thing? Okay? And my, uh, my leadership supported me. Okay? I keep going back to that love thing that we don't like to talk about in the Army. Somebody loved me. Okay? I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for someone taking care of me uh, and saying, okay, this guy wants to deploy. It's his therapy. And that's what I did. Okay? So, hopefully I answer your question. Where are you? Okay, great. Yeah, so we, we talked about the Bible. You want to join in on that conversation, you can too. Next question. Where are you? Sir Cadet Peters, Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Where? Um, Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. No football Southern team. Southern Illinois, you don't have a football team, man. No, sir, we do not. Um, so you mentioned you need to in go your to speech. Northern Illinois, man. <laughs> Were anyone from Northern Illinois here? Wear that purple and, and yellow? Huh? Yeah, that's right. That's the doggone lumberjacks. Right? Western Illinois, that's the lumberjacks, right? <laughs> I think they're the lumberjacks. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Sir, you mentioned in your speech um, about the intel side not having a lot, be able to keep up with your movements. Um, as a future MI officer, what are some things that uh, MI officers should, should consider on uh, their training of, and understanding of doctrine that would help facilitate um, the, the preparation for the fight and also how to support um, those on the ground during the battle itself? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to help you out here. I'm hard on intel officers. Okay? You remember that bullet up there that says, deal with reality? Guess what? Don't tell me what you think. Tell me what you know. You got it? Don't tell me what you think. Tell me what you know. You're going to struggle with that in your military career. So there are some commanders. They want to know what you think. Okay? And you're going to be drawing all this stuff and all this, you know. I want to know what you know, man. And if you don't know it, okay, I'll listen to you, your sit temp. But what I really want to hear is what you know, okay? We have a tendency to blend, blend. And it comes up to we don't know Jack. It's just as simple as I can make it, okay? So you need to remember those two things. It's okay for you to dream on acetate, okay? Because that's what you're going to be doing, dreaming on a computer and acetate. But I want to know what you know, okay? And if you don't know it, don't be telling me that this is what they're going to do. What you're really going to tell me is this is what you think they may do. I catch, when I was commanding, I constantly caught two saying, this is what they're going to do. And I would say, okay, so how do you know that? Up, 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 up. Tracking me? This is what I think or what they may do. Okay. All right, next. Go right, I'll come back to you. Yes, ma'am. Cadet New, Alabama A&M University. I'm coming uh, to speak at your... Um, commissioning ceremony a couple Who's of weeks. Who was there? Um, you know, your famous president of your university went to my great university. I'm just saying. <laughs> but anyway, go ahead. You just have an average football program, by the way. Uh, yeah. 
So Sir, prior to commissioning, did you plan on making this a career? If not, what changed your mind to do so? The answer is yes, and here's what I will tell you. I joined the Army my junior year of high school, the Army National Guard. My junior year of high school. I went to basic training between my summer of high, uh, uh, junior year and senior year, went to basic training. I knew then that I wanted to make the Army a career, okay? I came back in my senior year of, of high school, people thought I was crazy. Every day, man, I had on fatigues or wearing something that had Army on it and everything. It gets back to that love. This has been a passion. I love serving. Okay? And so the answer is yes. Next. Yeah, there he is. Come on, man. Where did you go to school? Cadet Davis, University of California, Davis. Our football team. Oh, man, team y'all is... too smart to have a football team. Yeah, we're, we're better known for our cows, sir. Yeah, you play lacrosse or something out there. Negative. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, sir, I've heard a lot of philosophies on uh, how you should allocate your time with uh, your soldiers that need more uh, professional and personal development. I've heard the philosophy that you should spend 80% of your time with the 20% of the soldiers that need the most development. I've also heard the opposite, that you should spend more time with the soldiers that have the most potential. Um, do you have a philosophy on this? Oh, yeah. I got one simple. You want to hear it? You spend all your time with your soldiers. Are you married? You gonna get married? <laughs> so here's the deal on spending time with soldiers. You guys cannot take this as a nine to seven deal. You can't take this as a 630 to five deal in the Army, okay? You're gonna find out, I asked if you were married for a reason, you all gonna be dealing with so many family issues, and guess what, most of you are not married. And you guys are gonna try and figure out how to handle all this stuff. There's so many issues out there with your soldiers that, that will require you to get involved. And so I gotta tell you, being a, a, a platoon leader, a second lieutenant, it is hard and it is demanding. Now, don't take this the wrong way. You will have your own personal time. But it is really demanding. If you do it right, it is demanding. But you also got to remember, you got to have balance in your lives as well, especially all you young whoopersnappers. You got to have some balance. You, you, you will be able to work that and figure it out because you will have a great platoon sergeant. He's going to make sure that you're successful. And you're going to have great squad leaders. But go back to what I said. You don't know whether you have, I'll use your words, mediocre soldiers. You really don't know that. That mediocre soldier that you're talking about, spend some time with them. Every single soldier that you perceive as mediocre, spend time with them. And I guarantee you, they will change your mind. Okay? Because the mediocre soldier probably came from a broken home, probably has low self-esteem, and a lot of other things are going on, and you're going to put your arms around that soldier, and you're going to motivate, inspire, and lead him, and he's going to be okay. Okay? So don't try and do this game, I'm going to stay with the squared away soldiers. Forget the rest of them. There will be some you will have to put out of the Army uh, that they're just not going to make it. But most of them, they want to be in the Army, and they want to do well. Most of your soldiers, they're going to want to do well. Okay? They're just going to need your leadership, your guidance. Okay? Talk to me, wild man. Where would you go to school? from Lincoln University of Missouri. Oh um, man, you got a little, little small football team, man. Uh, yes, sir. Division three. D2. Well, D two, two, three, it doesn't matter once you get to that low. 
Uh, yes, sir. You see a buck up on me? No, two. <laughs> <laughs> so we talk a lot about leadership uh, and uh, mentorship. So as far as when you became a second lieutenant, who was your mentor and how did they inspire you to do better? Oh, man, I had a um, great question. I have a lot of mentors out there. See, you also got to understand that uh, this is a lonely journey. And it helps to have mentors, OK? And so I got mentors such as I was General McCaffrey's aide, Barry McCaffrey. When he was a division commander, I was a, a captain. Uh, and he's been my biggest mentor. Lord Austin, General Austin, you saw him on the picture. He's been a huge mentor. Vince Brooks, huge mentor uh, of mine as well. I, got, I have several. And they all are not generals, by the way. But I will tell you on this mentor thing. People will tell you, go find a mentor. What I will tell you is, go find a mentor. But that mentor, that relationship between you and that mentor, is not going to last long unless you all have something in common. If you all don't have anything in common, you all may get this mentor thing going, but it's going to fizz out in about two or three weeks. So you need to have someone that you can relate to and they can relate to you. So have at the mentor because you're going to need it. They're going to give you guidance. They're going to give you counsel. They're going to help you out along the way. It's a wonderful thing because I certainly benefited from, from mentors. And don't be afraid to ask people from general all the way down to major. So that's the, your target. General all the way down to, to major. Ask them, hey, will you be my mentor? But again, make sure they have something in common with you. Okay, next. Yes, sir. Where'd you go to school, man? Sir, uh, Cadet Bacos, Bowie State University. Bowie State. Uh, your uh, you're PMS, got his name, Special Forces guy. Uh, Colonel Joel Thomas, sir. Yeah, and by the way, if you all do not know this, he went to the school that lost the cadet last year. You guys remember the guy that was uh, stabbed? Uh, I think it was at the bus station. Roger, sir. Richard Collins. Yeah. And so uh, glad to see you here. You all recovering well from that? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Uh, your your uh, boss, he wanted to know if I would do the commissioning ceremony. So when you get back, ask him if he still wants me to do it. If you all have someone else, I'm good with that, okay? Roger, sir. But go ahead. Ask uh, the question. One of the things you mentioned about being successful as a lieutenant is owning your mistakes. And I know as an LT and throughout your career, you're going to make mistakes, but I feel like that's easier said than done. Can you kind of elaborate as how does one own their mistakes? Okay. You know that self-awareness? You know, the doctor even had it up there, the self-awareness. You saw me with self-awareness. It's easy to own your mistakes, number one. Uh... If, I'll just use the Army values as an example. Are you all living by the Army values? No, you're not. You're in college. You think I'm crazy. No, you're not. I know what happens in college. Come on. So, but anyway, we won't go there. So when you come in, uh, in the Army, you definitely got to be living the, the Army values, okay? And part of that is about you. You know that integrity thing? So if you are straight with yourself, you'll own your mistakes. You will actually go in and sit down with your platoon sergeant, your soldier, and say, I messed this up. You may even ask for help, but I need your help in fixing it. Even as a three-star, I do that all the time. Do it all the time with my staff. Guys, I screwed this up. I gave you the wrong guidance, so you went this way, and you didn't understand my intent, and I should have should have ensured that you understood my intent before going all, all this way instead of going this way. You got to own it. Productivity level will go up in your organization if you own it. They got to see that you're human. They got to know that you're human. Okay? Next, my age doing giving the, that's it. 
but he's got to know that he's not in charge, I am. <laughs> so I'll take one more question. University of Connecticut, you finally moved up to Division I. Talk to me, my man, but you're getting slaughtered. Go ahead. <laughs> well, we were away from training distractors. See, this is another thing. When you all get to your units, remember this. You're going to have to fight to train. You're going to have to fight to train. Remember me talking about all these things like color guard and all these doggone, and you got to keep it in the back of your head. Army's number one job is to fight. Okay? And so while we were sitting there in Kuwait, there was nothing else to do but train. Sitting out in the middle of the de desert, man, you got to do it you know, do something, so training was the answer. And we ended up being a lean, mean fighting machine as a result of it. I've never been in a unit that was so well trained as my brigade. Okay? We could move on a dime, execute on a dime, fight on a dime. We could do it all. Okay? And I hope uh, when you all talk to General Perkins tonight, you ask him about that. And it was all live fire based. All life. A couple of times we made mistakes. Soldiers got shot. Thankfully, none of them died. Didn't deter us. We got back at it. Okay? Remember those mistakes? So when I was a battalion commander out in the desert, two of my soldiers while we were training got shot. Okay? I owned it. Sir, my fault. Didn't hurt me, did it? Huh? Okay. All right. So I'm going to close up with one thing. Where is that guy from the University of Alabama? All right. There he is right there. The national champions. You're very proud of that, right? I'm not going to put you on the spot, man. You're looking like, hey, man, I want to sit down. <laughs> Go ahead. You can sit down. All right. And who did they play? Georgia, okay? Both teams were pretty good, right? Both of them were ready. They were awesome, both of them. Both of them had doggone great quarterbacks and they were freshmen. Awesome. Huh? You guys, I know Clemson would say no. Look at them back there. Huh? They were awesome, right? Y'all watch the game? Okay. So you all know what the deal maker was? You know why he's sitting over there at national champions right now? No. I'm going to tell you why. It's the same thing that's going to make or break you. It's the same thing. So you all have to look at this thing as a professional football team. See, we're a professional football team. And when we go to war, we play away games. We play away games, right? And we go to war, we want to be ready, right? Right? Y'all don't act like you want to be ready. All right, so I want you to think about that enemy. Well, he wants to be ready too. Okay? It's just like Alabama and Georgia. Both of them want to be ready. You want to be ready. But here's why Alabama won the game. We got any University of Georgia fans in here, by the way? I don't. Great. All right. Let me tell you why Alabama won the game. It's pretty simple. It's the thing that I'm looking for in every single one of my soldiers. And Dabo Sweeney said it. See, I told you I was going to bring Clemson in on this. Dabo Sweeney said it. And I like to jump out of my chair when Dabo Sweeney said it. It's simple. Bring your own guts. Bring your own guts. If you bring your own guts, we'll win. If you take it Alabama, they had a lot of guts for that freshman and that coach to call that play. 
in the corner of the end zone. That takes guts. Bring your own guts. And that's why they won the game. Both teams were ready. It could have been either team winning this game. But that was a gutsy call. Bring your own guts. That's what it's all about. Thank you all very much in Georgia.